It's about 10 o'clock. I'm doing an interview of one of the oldest citizens in, in the city of Mound Bayou, Mississippi. My name is Herman Johnson, and we are doing this for a historical purpose. So at this time, we'd like to get some information from C. Preston Holmes. Okay. Yes, so uh, as, a, as, a, as a child going to school and in the church, was that the regular way that people lived in town? No. No, then? Then, yes. I don't know about I don't know more much about people, but we went to school any time there was school, my sister and I, and uh, we went to school when he was over. We went to church in Sunday morning, Sunday school in church at Bethlehem Church in Mile Bible. What about the discipline of children having to deal with the community? Well, the, the, there's a man named Mr. Taylor. He was a cotton buyer, first cotton buyer in Mile Bible, and incidentally, he lived the next house to my house right now. Uh, his, his mother, we had a whole lot of children going to school, going, going to church at Bethel. We must have had a, uh, what I call a whole lot for a little time, maybe at least. I remember when Bethel Church had more than 200 people in the membership. Now we have less than 100. Uh -huh. See? So uh, kids went to Sunday school. Right now we have fraternities and many other organizations, sororities, and then we're going to do school and church primarily. Did you did you ever do any farm work? No. Oh, yes, I picked some cotton. My father was not a farmer, but I picked cotton. But I picked cotton till the school opened. Because for the first day school opened, I well, I was in school at my father's and mother's request. What, did did the Mount Bayouans have a lot of farmers in the area when a lot you were of a kid? Farmers and a lot of black landowners in Mount Bayou at the time. Okay. So, so, uh, so, were whites in Mount Bay as well? No, but I can tell you an instance that the road, the railroad, the road was not gravel. It was dirty. They were ran parallel, pretty much parallel to the heart of town. Right. And I remember when I was a little boy, spraying in the front yard with water, all dust. Right. A family in an open car, all cars at that time were open, all that I saw. And we sprayed of dirt, dirt, so when the cars passed by, very few cars, all so much dust was not run the house. And I saw this family pass in this car slowly and come back slowly and pass again. It didn't mean a thing to me. And I guess that consciousness couldn't keep it. They came over and asked this young boy, I see a store down here named Cohen. Is that a black man? And, and I didn't I didn't know have the idea then why they were so much Christian. But in later years I know there might a few black people named Cohen and they must have known it even better than I. But they were very much obviously very much concerned about a man named Cohen and me being black in Mount Valley, Mississippi. So these were white people? Yes, they were white people in the and, and store, the McCorn store was less than 30 yards from the hard highway. Right. And they said his name on the, on the store. And they just couldn't understand, obviously, how he could be named Coin and Black. <laughs> I remember that very distinctively. <laughs> Mount Bay had some uh, dark days as well. The what? Mount Bay had some dark days. Uh, what kind of day? Dark. Yes. And but, racial situations went on. Well, you see, we put a lot of emphasis in church, and we had a very active mayor. His name was B.A. Green, a Harvard graduate. And we had, uh, we had some big characters, folks who really loved our community, and we were kind of bound close together. Now, we had differences of opinion. Uh, they had differences of opinion. But um, I about stayed in less than 1,000 for years population-wise, because when I first started working the post office in 1938, the stamp was two cents, a postal card was one cent, and they paid postal clerk uh, $54 a month, and I was described as a, 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 a 
national, properly employed at $54 a month. $54 You're pretty month. well to do. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but uh, and my, my, my wife, I finished high school in 32, and my wife, Pauline, as I said, she was school teacher at uh, $45 a month. So between the two of us, we made $99 a month. Between the two of us. That was a good salary then. <laughs> well, I, you can call it good. Because <laughs> I think you could buy a whole lot with $99. My first new car cost me the note for $40 a month. $40 <laughs> a month. But that's a big, that's a big thing. My car, my car was $40 a month. My salary was $54 a month. But I, there were so few cars, I could make money transporting people. People would give me money for transporting them. That would supplement my, my income. What was your first car? A Ford in 1940. A 1940 Ford? That's right. Where is that car? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. But that was, uh, that was, see, that was good. The first cars I remember were be on large cars, much larger than Ford. They owned by Fred Miller, for instance. He was head of Elf. And he had a Bearcat Stutz or something great big, but it was a novelty. And, but uh, my first car was uh, in 19. I started working for the post office in 38. What you got? And the first car. What you got? Was a Ford. Six. Okay. Okay. Now, you went to college. Yes. Where did you go? Uh, the first college I went to was uh, Camel College in Jackson, Mississippi. But after two years, I really discovered that they didn't offer pre-made courses. So uh, the next year, but Hot, in Holly Springs, Rush College, who did offer pre-made. So I went to my father sent me to Rush College in Holly Springs. And you said you ended up not going as a doctor. Not, that's right. When I came out in '35. In 1935, I just finished three years. I first went to college in 32, and finished in 30, came out of college, and didn't go back with the loss of my father. Right. And I was going. I meant to go back, but I, I started buying things for my mother who had made six sacrifices to send me to school. We had sent me to school. That I, I stayed there 39 years. Started off as a clerk. I was postmaster for the last 10 or 15 years. You went to the Army? Yes, I went to the Army in 1940. In 44, came out in 1946. I served three, primarily three years. Europe and Asia. I, I think at one point you told me about your, some of your experiences in the Army. There were some racial things that happened to you? Well, all my officers were white. I was a, I was a clerk, so I had the records. Of all, of all, of all the enlisted men, but uh, I don't know if it popularized me if I tell you, <laughs> but uh, but serves for life. But uh, which means when you go to the army, they give you an examination early, uh, and I could see. Well, yeah. Eight people doing that. Hold, hold on one minute. Yeah. So, so, so you went to the army. Now, tell me a little bit about something. Else. Some of the army but, things uh, that happened? I wasn't in the army for months before we were going overseas. And for leaving out of New York, they didn't tell us where you were going. But about two, oh, about two days after we were out of Harvard, they gave us a pamphlet. Pamphlet. And they were, had German in it and French. So we surmised we were going to Europe, not to Japan. And I was a guy. And our, our kids were going to we went to college together. Incidentally, he was a postal clerk, as was I. And his wife was a school teacher, as was my wife. But he was also a classmate of mine. And uh, he knew the courses I was taking and the guys out of these pamphlets, many of them never ever had any in any foreign languages. I'd had French and I'd had German and as a proposed medical student I also had Latin. But uh, we saw in New York before we sailed, left sailing, we saw this guy, the police had him, put him back on our outfit, you know, 
So we just surmised he'd gone AWOL from the previous side meeting and also had caught him and put him on our ship uh -huh. going to go in Europe. But one day, this friend of mine who knew me in college, he knew me and he knew I had taken these foreign languages. So I was kind of helping the guys in their French and German. Are you following me? Right. But this guy he picked up in New York, I just presumed he was a guy who had gone AWOL and they caught him and put him on our outfit. But we are in my teaching one day on on this boat, incidentally, that was oh there was thousands of us going over simultaneously. Are you following me? Uh huh. And uh this fellow's hair wasn't trimmed, clothes wasn't pressed, mouth wasn't shaved. He just looked like a nobody. But we talking got a little, a little my little French instructor, people ask me question, what's the name, where you He said something sounds just like my French teacher I had about 15 years before. So when I went downstairs, down in the hull of the ship, seven floors beneath the surface of the water, I pulled his record. And this is what I discovered. His name, Vincent W. Byers, age 27, home, he was not Kansas. But the important thing, schooling, grammar school, graduate, <laughs> high school, and several colleges, including the University of Sabon in Paris, France. Wow. And most importantly, occupation, professor of Romance Language at Harvard University. Wow. I went back down in the bottom of my ship and I didn't come out in three days. <laughs> here I am with no knowledge, virtually, and here he was professor of Romance Languages at Howard University, but he was a misfit in the army. He just could not stand, with all of his education, taking advice and orders from first person, so much less educated than himself. And so he was a misfit the whole, he took an act of Congress to make him a PFC. Wow. He was really one unhappy soul, and he, and he never changed the time it was ever. However, when we were in Germany, our commander, commander had to take him with us because right. he could interpret right. what you see. When we were in France, the same thing. We landed him, as a matter of fact, we landed him in France. And we stayed in France for, till the war was over, till we won. And it's been, I was part of that June 6th invasion. You know, but after that was all, three months later, we were going now to Japan, 57 days at sea, if we and that boat had made me so sick, 13 days to see, leave me out of New York, going to La Havre. We landed in the laws in California, in the laws in France. But several months later, maybe about nine months later, we were going to Japan. And we were leaving South Marseille, that's in southern France, going to Tokyo, Japan, 57 days to see. If we did it. But they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima before we got to Japan, right. and we were turned around. As in 1946, I, was, I got out of the service in 1900. I was discharged, but I did my best to to be to do what I was told when I was in the service. I, now it's over. I, I was glad I went, but there were certain days when I was when situations were bad and the orders were very irregular and discrimination was very imminent. As days I wish I had not gone. Because I, I could not, I didn't have to go. I was called and told them what I was doing. They gave me 12 months before. After 12 months, I called again, told them what I was doing. I was supposed to put. Give me, give me some of those instances huh? where, give me some of those instances where the racial situation was bad enough for you to say I need to go home. I tell you in the history, you gonna publicize this and make me hate it? Uh, my right? Oh no, history. no, this is history. I just, I'm trying to get history. Well, the mere fact, this, 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 this virus I told you about it, you do feel, I, I scored 139 on the examination. I saw one officer that came within 20, 20 points of my point, one, but I didn't let that, Changed my mind. They were officers. I was a listed man. I tell you one thing. Helped a lot. 
really help the relationship a lot. I could play bridge, and they learned I could play bridge. I had a partner who could play bridge. And officers had enlisted me, and enlisted me, and officers had very little contact and association. Now, after, this is after, after I'd been in the service maybe a year and a half. And, and I had a friend who could also play bridge. Her name is Fug from Baltimore, Maryland. Those officers pick us up most every afternoon in their official car and take us over to a place where we play bridge. This is enlisted man and I against these officers. And, and two officers take four, four people to play bridge. And one incident I remember that I should be ashamed of. They were by the drinks. They were always soft drinks. I played with my black partner. He played with his white officer. He said, where's my co cobra? All us had coats that they bought. I set my coat up on the fence and I was drinking this white officer's coat. <laughs> he was about to look it. And he just took it from him. And when I had not drunk, he drank it. Uh -huh. But uh, that was the folks. So that was after we came back from the football to Arizona. <laughs> I think where the snakes were. <laughs> but that happened. I, I set my coat right here and I was drinking his officer's coat. And he was looking for his coat. And, Where's my coat? I'm drinking his coat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now that was very, that was one of the most embarrassing situations. And I one of the good situations was uh, when I, I was soldier of the week on certain situations. But it was discrimination in the Army. To keep an idea, Army camps are generally way out in the country because the students have pra practice gun shooting. We had, they had buses to go into the city every 15 minutes. All the drivers were white. But you were known, but you knew to go to the back of the city bus. And the white soldiers sat in the front of the bus. One night in camp in Virginia, two guys got on the bus, one one, one black and one white. They had on CITO, Southeast Asia uniform, so if you if you were at least intelligent, you know that they were not like you. Both of them went to the back of the bus. You know, I noticed a white driver kept beckoning for the white guy from the back of the bus because the front of that guy ignored him. And when he could no longer ignore him, he said, what do you want? Come up here. Why? We just don't sit back. From one word, they headed to another. And the guy said, the trouble is you guys down here 